Hello and welcome to Climbing Daily and welcome to Craig Di Martino. Craig, you have an incredible story to do with injury, redemption, coming back, <laughs> yeah. fighting through some struggle. It, yeah, it's yeah. absolutely awesome. But let's start at the beginning. Okay. I know your name's Craig, but yeah. where are you from? How old are you? How long have you been a climber for? Been a climber for about 30 years. It's kind of all I ever did. Um, I'm based in Loveland, Colorado, and then travel pretty extensively around the States and then over in Europe and things like that. So kind of always bouncing around. Let's talk about the leg and the yes. injury that you received. Uh, tell me about it from the beginning. What happened? So I was climbing in 2002 with a really good friend of mine, and uh, we were in Rocky Mountain National Park, and we were climbing a route, and we were going to just do the first pitch of the route. And just through miscommunicating like how we were going to get back down, uh, he thought he was going to come up to the ledge with me. I thought he was going to lower me back down the top rope. And so we never really communicated that and uh, got to the anchor, clipped in, rigged it all up. Um, he took me off belay and he walked away, which is pretty normal. He was going to get his shoes. And so when I was ready to be lowered, I kind of, you know, our belay commands weren't super clear. And uh, I said, okay, I'm all you. And he said, okay, you're good. And so I heard that and I just unclipped and sat back. And I was a hundred feet off the deck and started falling. And I knew I was falling, you know, I knew something was wrong. And so I pushed really hard to get back from the cliff a little bit to see where I was going. It's kind of a steep route. And it, it tipped me over to my side and then I kept falling and about 20 feet from the ground I hit a dead tree. And luckily that stood me back up. And so I landed kind of standing on both legs and just shattered both my legs, so I had compound fractures of both legs on the ankles, um, tibia, fibular, and then the shockwave just kept going up and it broke my back at L2. It actually crushed it down, so I don't even have it anymore. They had to kind of wedge it back together. Broke my back, oh, ribs on the right side, uh, shoulder, tore my shoulder up, and then broke my neck at C5, C6. And then I just kind of crumpled into the, the talus box and severed the artery in my right leg too. So I was bleeding really badly, um, but luckily my friend had a little bit of uh, first aid experience. So he kind of like did a bit of damage control and then started that long arduous process of getting me out. So that's how, in a nutshell, what happened. And were you conscious throughout that initial moment? So after the impact, were you, were you awake? Sadly, yeah, I was, so when I hit, I don't remember hitting, I remember falling. And then all of a sudden, the next thing I remember is just looking up at him and I saw him, his, he was freaking out. And so uh, I was awake the whole time. So we formulated a plan. Um, when search and rescue got there, I was awake for the whole carry out. I didn't really go under until they put me on the Flight for Life helicopter. They moved me in and they hadn't, because I punctured the lung on my right side too where the ribs broke, um, I couldn't breathe real well. So they, they wouldn't give me pain meds. They they want to wait. And when they, I know, they, it would be really nice. Um, they put me in the chopper though and they bumped my feet. And I was like, oh my God, it was terrible. Um, Cause you know, I knew my back was hurt, but that's all I could really feel. Um, and then they gave me uh, something. And that's kind of the last thing I remember until kind of waking up in the hospital then afterwards. You really wondered how well he would do. I mean, the obviously a very serious injury. We could tell that he had what we call an L2 burst fracture, burst compression fracture, where the bone is smashed down. Part of the bone went posterior into the spinal canal. Dr. Turner told me that his uh, spinal column was 90% uh, compromised, which is a very significant amount. That he didn't expect Craig to live, you know, more than an hour when they got him there. Obviously, that is a tremendously terrifying experience for anyone. Any but, but you, being such a passionate climber, when did your mind start thinking, you know, this, this could be it for me as a climber? You know, when you knew you were through the woods and you were going to survive, when did the thought start ticking in that your lifestyle is going to change drastically here? You know, it, it, was, it was right away. You know, once I got out of intensive care, I was in into ICU for five days and on a breather, a ventilator. When they moved me out of there, I was talking to my wife and I remember thinking like, oh, this is, yeah, this is totally different now. Like nothing's going to be the same. And even climbing, I, I you know, I, I didn't know that if, if I was going to climb again and if I was going to climb again, what was that going to be like? And so we would just have these long conversations about like, what do we do? Like we built our whole life around climbing. So all of a sudden that's removed from the, the equation. And you, you, you kind of struggle with like, well, if I'm not that, then what am I at that point? And the leg being amputated, was that something that happened straight away or was that a process? It was, so I, I got out of the hospital, I was in for about three months 
uh, I went home, still had my leg. And about a year went by and I was, I tried to climb like I was in a cast, one of those walking casts. And so, you know, I tried to climb with a cast on, tried to climb. I couldn't get my shoe in a, uh, or my foot in a shoe um, because it was so misshapen and had so much hardware in it. And so I was like, you know, what do I, what do I do with this? And I started talking to my doctor and I started, I met a couple athletes who had amputated after an accident and they, they were mostly skiers, but they said, you know, once you do it, like once you get your head around this idea, you can actually get back to whatever you want. And so once I heard that, then I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to go back in. And so at 18 months, went back in and amputated, went back home, you learn to rewalk. And then really about four months after I could put a shoe on because it's a prosthetic so it goes right on and then uh, I was climbing again uh, top roping badly <laughs> and uh, and trying to figure out like I was, I was just scared out of my mind and so uh, just relearning how to move my body and they had my back and neck got fused so you have to figure out like how, where, how do you bend how do you move um, and it all was a learning process. I was belaying Maya and she did this little short 5-8 she did great on it, she came down, and she kind of turned to Craig and she was like, hey, are you gonna climb this? It just caught me so off guard. He was like, well, yeah. Started climbing and it was the, just the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Craig, I wanted to talk to you about the prosthetic itself because it's something I saw at Outdoor during the trade show recently yeah, yeah. in Munich. Yep. Uh, how have you adapted it to fit your needs as a climber? So we did, so this is the one that I typically climb on. This. This foot was made by Evolve. We kind of brainstormed back and forth. And then Arcturex was like, well, what else would you, what other kind of feet would you want? And uh, you can kind of like, it's like buying a mountain bike. You can kind of pick and choose what you put on. <laughs> uh, we had an industrial designer make a, he fashioned it after uh, a mountain goat's foot. I didn't start a project with a problem. I think I started with a curiosity. When I was browsing YouTube videos and I saw this clip of mountain goats climbing a nearly vertical wall, I was just so amazed by their climbing ability. And I wanted to connect the dots. I wanted to see if there's anything I can learn from mountain goats and apply that into human bodies. And so the foot, the mountain goat's foot can kind of do this really wild movement and stick on the rock really well. When a climber puts force on the toe part of the foot, the angle pivots and the linkage system that converts rotary motion to linear motion compresses the spring. Once the pressure is released, the pivot bounces back, releasing elastic potential energy. This mechanism replaces the Achilles tendon in a human foot. So he made this really cool, like, kind of like a thin crack foot for me. And uh, we kind of did this demo and breaking and fixing and redoing all that things. And so what we, the idea was, okay, this foot covers a really wide array of terrain. Um, but if you want like a specialized thing, this is where this other foot would, would work. And so we kind of were doing a testing. We just finished up a film on it um, and just trying to figure out like, okay, where does it fit in? What's its strong suit? Um, because you have this foot and then you'd have something else for, you know, just specialty items. And so I did the route probably two or three times up to like a high point where we had, um, you know, I could kind of experiment in different pieces of the crack. And as I was cranking into it, like the one, one of the times, um, are you ready? I'm gonna show it yes. to you. And before the injury, because I can imagine, like, it's, for example, I'm rubbish at slab climbing, right? <laughs> but I imagine if I've suddenly got a foot that's really good at slab climbing, you have right. to sort of change your climbing mentality. Right. Did that happen to you? Were you suddenly like, I, I can do cracks really well, so now I'm a crack climber? Or were you just pretty much the same climber you always were? I think, I mean, I, everyone hates slab climbing anyway, yeah, right? Yeah. So, I mean, there you go. Um, I think what the... F the new kind of climbing was okay now all of a sudden I can climb on these really tiny edges because these edge really really well it's amazing um, and so I thought okay I'm gonna my strong suit's gonna be that like you know sport climbing edges and then I thought well if, if you could crack climb because I love to crack climb what would that look like and so this foot 
Perfect Hands for me is like a number two, mm -hmm. number one and number two, like somewhere in the middle. And uh, this foot gets stuck in those. So as soon as it goes in, I can watch it. It sits in like a nut and I'm like, damn it, that's in there. And so, I mean, it's gotten so stuck. Sometimes I've, I've left it. You just, it'll stick out of the crack and you have to just go buy it and you get it on. Did you clip it? No, I should have. <laughs> My friend said, just tie it off. <laughs> um, but I was like, shit, I need something that will kind of bridge that gap. And so that's where this new foot came in, where you, this thing, it doesn't get stuck so much because it is so narrow, it, it almost goes in like a pin. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as I crank my knee over it, it, it's locked. And so I like, the, I like the way it interfaces with a crack. I haven't been on anything really challenging with it yet, um, but I'm, I'm kind of curious to see where it goes. Being able to like immerse myself in it, it's actually kind of cathartic for me because I get to go uh, do the thing that on the surface, you know, almost killed me, but beneath that surface is this really rich experience, and I really crave that experience. And in terms of general fitness for you, because mm -hmm. you're obviously a very active person, does it allow you, without the climbing shoe on and the other prosthetics, can you, can you pretty much continue your lifestyle? Or again, is it something you've had to adapt? No, I, I feel like I've, you adapt your lifestyle to it for sure because like your leg your your leg and your stump are only going to do so much during a day but like even today like we did a clinic up in the in the high country and you know kind of pounding down talus and all that stuff with a pack on you just realize like okay i can do that absolutely but then the next day or that evening your leg is your stump just kind of hurts um but i i mean i say that to my wife and she's like well my knees hurt so there you go i mean so i think we all feel like something and just you just kind of adjust to it a little bit differently If you look at yourself and you think I feel powerful then that narrative is in your head and you're creating that new pathway so that pathway now is that I'm I'm powerful and so if you look that way and you think that way then you're probably gonna be that way in some form I feel like when I put my prosthetic on it's an extension of me if it's this ugly clumpy thing that just looks like crap and moves like crap or even if it looks like crap but moves really well it's it's going to affect how i view it whereas if i put something on that's elegant and you know streamlined and efficient that makes me feel more efficient and streamlined and so that only helps my climbing then <laughs> 